until now what we've seen <coughs> uh, is uh, the Ramchal has spoken about the fact that mitzvahs <coughs> that mitzvahs um, are the instruments that are used to purify the body so the neshama, the soul can express itself uh, but the Ramchal did not express specific mitzvahs. He only just said mitzvahs in general. What he does now, uh, he's going to uh, he's going to specify three mitzvahs, which is interesting, as very critical mitzvahs to do. Because not only will they mezakech the goof, which means they will purify the physical body, but they're from they're very important in and of itself and therefore he will single them out and that's a very important concept what are these mitzvahs <coughs> <coughs> uh, so I'm um, Chelek Dalad uh, Hey and he says that that which you should know and you should tremendously strengthen yourself is the mitzvah of Ahavo and Yira to love God and to fear him <coughs> And then he tries to explain what, how do you develop fear and how do you develop love. <clears throat> I had once spoken about this quite a while ago about the whole concept of dvekas, attachment to God and so on, and experiencing the Rosham. <clears throat> but as we will see, the concept of Av and Yira is not just that there are mitzvahs, which there are. And not only that, there are mitzvahs which are called tamidiyos. They are 24 hour. You see, this, they're 24-7, uh, as they say, you know. Because at any given moment, you can feel love of God and fear of God. So it, it's not a physical act that takes place only within a certain circumstance, situation, or time period, whatever. No. <clears throat> These two mitzvahs are unrestricted in terms of time. They can be performed at any instant in time. Hey, you can get up 3 a.m. in the morning, right? And you can engage in Ava and Yira, loving God and fearing God. It doesn't make a difference, you see, which is interesting. <clears throat> so there's no question that these mitzvahs, Ava, loving God and fearing God, are unique, you see. But w what we really have to understand is what are they? <clears throat> so let's take, talk about Yira first, fear of God. <clears throat> what does it mean to fear somebody? Usually a person fears an emo fear is an emotion, right? That a person has when he feels threatened. The Rabbanisham gave a person the ability to flee. But first he has to realize that there's a threat. But apparently that's not enough, you see. When, when, we, f when we run away from something, it's because we experience fear. And that's why we run away. It's very possible if a person sees a threat and doesn't experience the emotion called fear, he won't run away, you see. So the fear forces us to run away. The anxiety or the fear. Now fear is what? Fear is an emotion toward an object which is threatening you, which you know. You know that which is threatening you. Anxiety, which is the same as fear, is a feeling or an emotion that you experience when that which threatens you is unknown. You just feel anxious, you see. And in order to know really what you're fearing, what you're afraid of, you really have to analyze it and say, yes, so, wait a minute, what am I afraid of really? You see, <clears throat> so fear is an obvious reaction to an obvious threat. Anxiety, however, <clears throat> is a fear reaction to an unknown threat. And as I said, it needs analysis of what is going on. So the obvious concept of fear is because that which you fear, the stimulus or the source of the fear, has to be a threat to you. And there are many types of threat. It can be a threat to your physical body, right? <clears throat> or there's a threat to your sense of self. That's much more subtle, you know. If you're in a room and you meet a person, <clears throat> the human mind is very interesting is something he does all the time. It's like radar. The human mind is always assessing the fear threshold of the situation. 
always. It's a 24-7 operation. It's interesting, obviously, because the human mind <coughs> is always concerned about self-preservation, that somebody will harm me, you see. <coughs> so when you meet any person, you will immediately size him up in terms of his fear quality within 30 seconds, but very, very quick. Okay, <coughs> and in 30 seconds, you're gonna say to yourself, I like him, or I don't really care about this guy, or I can't stand this guy, you see. <coughs> and there's all kinds of cues which the mind looks for in fear. It's very interesting, you know. But we're doing this 24-7 on a constant basis, you see. And it's not only if you meet somebody, if you go out into the street immediately, you've got your radar, you got your antenna up to size up the fear situation. If there is, if there is or there isn't. Of course, if there is, it's fight or flight. You can either run away or you can stand your ground and fight it. Um, so, uh, now, what also is interesting is fear is not only on a specific threat which you can see, but fear is also a threat to your self-worth. You know, some people, you, sometimes you meet a person that you could see he's very aggressive, you know, verbally. And if you say something wrong, he will attack you verbally. You know, say, hey, are you crazy? What are you talking about? Who are you anyway? You're an idiot, right? That's, that's an attack on your sense of worth, on your sense of who you are. Now that, in many ways, is almost more threatening than if a guy says to you, hey, I'm gonna beat you up. You see? <clears throat> so you have to remember, threat is not only physical. Threat is also psychological. <clears throat> if somebody threatens your ego, your sense of self, <laughs> your sense of uh, adequacy, <laughs> that is also what a person is on the lookout, always, you see. So therefore, that's the concept of fear. It is an emotion or a feeling that we experience when we are threatened by something or somebody or some situation. So when he says they have to fear God, what does that mean? What's a threat? The threat is what's called punishment, you see. Because God says clearly that if you don't do the mitzvahs, right, there's gonna be consequences to pay and we have several <coughs> places in the Torah, it's called the Toichacha, right? The rebuke or the admonition, where God says, here's what I'm gonna do to you if you don't observe the commandments, the mitzvahs. And of course, when you read that, it's threatening. It's terrible. You can't do worse than what God's saying, you know, uh, in the Torah itself, you know. So therefore, years hachet, to fear God, why? Because God is always looking at you you know, he never goes away on vacation. He's never biased. You can't buy him off, right? God, in many ways, is a very threatening being. You see? Because we know he means what he says. And he will do what he says. Now, that doesn't mean he's not a compassionate being. But ultimately, you know, he's going to do what he says. As the, as the, uh, as Pirkei Obis, actually in Paragimel today, where it says, you know, the store is open, right? The, uh, you can walk in, the chenvin is open, right? You can walk in, you can take whatever you want. It's like the cafeteria. You remember your old cafeteria? I don't know if you remember that, you know, where you, you, you went by a whole uh, series of, uh, what do you call it, compartments, and you selected the food, and then at the end there was a cash register. Remember that guy? I, mean, I don't know if they have them anymore. Yeah, but they probably do at certain places, you know? So there's a guy with a cash register, right? And all of a sudden, hey, you know, it's very nice. You figure out, well, I'm taking all this stuff, you know? And all of a sudden the guy says, excuse me, you know, pay up. In many ways, that's really what it is. You have free access to the world in many ways. You know, it's whatever you want to do, basically you can do, if it's not restricted by somebody, government or whatever, you know? But there's a concept when you get to the end there is what's called, you know what the word for it is, accountability. There is accountability. It means you could do what you want, but in the end, there is a consequence called accountability. And you will be asked to be accountable, you see. 
this is part of the concept, you know. If people understood that there's accountability, they would stop doing many, many things, you see. But um, you know, I, I, I once said that. Uh, so it's a different one. Because there is accountability, there is fear. So that's called Yir Sachet, right? That's called fear of God, right? Because if you sin, there's accountability, which will involve some type of consequence, punishment. Unless, of course, you do tshuva, you repent, and so on. Uh, so that's the first level of fear. And that's the simplest level of fear. There's a second type of fear. Remember what the concept is. The concept is to be very cautious and careful because there's something that's threatening you. You see? So, like I said, the first reason why you're threatened is because somebody is going to harm you, and that's your sachet. You do a sin, God's going to come after you, so to speak, and you're accountable, and you will be punished. Okay? So, therefore, punishment is the threat you will experience. You're talking about physical. Physical, yeah. Well, it could be psychological, too. You know, I mean, with God, it doesn't make a difference. You know, he can put some guy in an insane asylum. That's as much, pun in fact, it's worse punishment because he's dysfunctional. You know, there are a lot of psychotics. You know what I'm saying? And uh, which are in mental institutions, there are a lot of psychotics that are walking around. <clears throat> but anyway, if the motion wants, he can destroy your, me your, your, your entire uh, uh, mental stability. Rachmanis. And forget about the, you know, forget about that, you know, that mental facility, right? A lot of walk people walking around are crazy. We know that, right? The son of Tokum has that, doesn't it? That what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, that's that's the real, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the real, yeah, I mean, Sanatoikov, you know. you know. Who, but the interesting about Sanatoikov, which we say on Mashon Yom Kippur, is that he just, just doesn't say who will live and die, but then he goes to a description of how you will die. You know, he's got to, you know, somebody's going to get choked to death. And, Drown in death, you know, and he'd be burnt, and, uh, burnt alive. I mean, it's, it's like a, a gory details of how uh, different ways the Rebbeinu can kill a person, you know. So, obviously, it's very frightening and so on. That's but, a, <coughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Well, it's dinam, bezdin. So, therefore, we have years ahead, okay? But the second type of year isn't the fear of sin or punishment, right? It's the fear that you have when you stand in the presence of of an awesome presence, you see. That's a different type of fear, <clears throat> you see. When you stand in front of a being who God is, that is awesome in his presence, and in terms of his being and so on, you know, there is a fear. The question is why? Why if you're standing in the presence of an awesome being, what are you afraid of? I'm not gonna do anything to you. Anybody know the answer? Superior. And therefore? Potential. Potential. Self-worth. What? The fear of self-worth. Okay, you, both of you guys. Yeah, because what you do is you compare you to him. You see, he is way off the charts in terms of his greatness and superiority, and that immediately tells you that you're way off the charts in the other end. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're zero, you know? You're nobody. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? So that's also a fear. It's interesting, you see. That's a fear of vulnerability of who I am. You mean, I'm really a nobody. Because, you know, how, you know how, how do we get a sense of worth in many ways, right? We compare ourselves to others, right? You compare yourself to another guy. They say, this guy, this guy, who, who is this guy? He's a schlepper. It's a schmata. So then you get an ego lift, right? But what happens if you're in a room filled with geniuses or unbelievable accomplished people, right? You know what I'm saying? Or in a family. Um, what? Or yeah, or the family, you know. Um, imagine if you uh, you just opened a business, right? And you by accident uh, you're in a hotel, you know, trying to get customers, right? And by accident you walked in the room, right? And who's sitting on the table there having a meeting? Yeah, the founder of Google, AT and T, Microsoft, right? GE, GM, and they're all sitting in a meeting. And you walked in, you know, you, you look at them and you look at me and say, you know, you know, the the contrast is beyond belief. You see, so you don't feel very good when you walk into that room, that's for sure, you know. <clears throat> Although that is really a, a false 
you know, because uh, what they did has nothing to do with them. God gave them all the success, which is something they don't realize. Every penny that they made is because it was a decree from God. You know, as far as you're concerned, you and them are at least equal, if not far superior. But you'd never believe that because they got the cash and you got zero. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, why and is, that's why we, is your feeling been inadequacy or, or what? Why does that lead to the fear? Because self-worth, a lack of self-worth, is always frightening. Because ultimately, what it means in terms of self-preservation, because if you are nobody, you, you're going to die. You're nobody. That means you are incompetent, inadequate to survive. You see, ultimately, psychologically, the greatest fear of all is what? Death. That is the greatest fear, you see. Except we're many layers away, you see. It's but if you get, what? It's subconscious, you see. Well, it's, you, you, you feel the, uh, like, a, like a nobody, and subconsciously that means that you're closer to death. It's correct, yeah. That's why the lack of self-worth really uh, tells you that, you know, you may die. And that's self-preservation, which is, of course, what God put in us to survive. You know, <clears throat> uh, so therefore... <clears throat> The, the fear, the, the, the greatest fear of all is the fear of death. And this concept of self-preservation is to preserve or to protect against that feeling, you see. And when a person has that type of feeling of lack of self-worth, that's frightening. That's extremely anxiety-provoking, as they say. <clears throat> and the truth is, ultimately speaking, I will tell you, that all mental health, I don't care what problem you have, all emotional disorders are always ultimately rooted in a lack of self-worth. You have no idea how fundamental. And the mind tries to protect itself against its own understanding, realization that it is worth nothing by erecting enormous amount of defensive postures. You see, for instance, the guy takes a test, right? And he gets a, he gets a 20. Now, he looks at the t test 20, and what does that 20 tell you? You're an idiot. <laughs> How could you get a 20? What does that tell you about yourself? Yes? Now, but you can't tolerate that, because that's extremely anxiety-provoking, isn't it? To get a 20, and to realize that you're a nobody, you're an idiot, right? You can't tolerate that, correct? So what do you do? You say, I'm not an idiot. The teacher's an idiot. What kind of test is this? You see, he gave a test that PhDs can pass. You see what I'm saying? And I'm not a PhD, but if I'm not a PhD, I don't have to be afraid. I'm not a PhD. If I was a PhD, I would be afraid. You see, <clears throat> so that's called the defense mechanism. What's the name of that defense mechanism? Projection. Who? Projection. No, rationalization. <clears throat> there are over 50 defense mechanisms that the human mind can use. What a creative genius that everybody is, you know? In order to protect against anxiety, which is a result of a lack of self-worth or self-esteem or self-respect. Very complex, you know? And then, you know, it's a, whatever, whatever. anyways. Uh, so therefore, <clears throat> when you're in a being, standing in front of a being that is awesome, and the Bershom is awesome. I mean, even awesome doesn't describe who he is. You see, immediately you feel like a zero. That's threatening. You see? So it's not the punishment, because the fact that he's awesome doesn't mean he's gonna come after you, but it is threatening because it does remind you of your complete inferiority and inadequacy. You see? So that's a second fear. And that fear is far greater to have than the fear of punishment. Because the fear of punishment is simple. Uh, he's gonna whack you, right? But the fear of awesome is much greater, why? Why is that a much greater madrego or level of avoida, of working, or serving God? Why? <clears throat> because fear of God that he's going to punish you, right, means that you recognize that there's an accountability. But fear of his awesomeness means you recognize that he is awesome. Means you've worked on a level where you now understand who he is. That's a tremendous level right of depth of understanding who god is but it's not only that it's also a muna <clears throat> you believe in god right and you understand and believe that he's awesome and that is a tremendous level of service of to god 
You see? Got that? That's called Yerus That's called Yerus correct. That's right. But there's a third fear. It's interesting. Most people don't talk about this third fear. <clears throat> and that is a fear which is greater than Yerus <coughs> I'll give you, I'll give you, give you, let me tell you the story that illustrates this fear. Imagine Moshe Rabbeinu was talking to God for seven days, by the way. You don't realize in Shemois, in the beginning of Shemois, when he's God saying, go and take my people out, right? That discussion was for seven days. Have you imagined? And basically for seven days, right, he was defying God. Oh, I don't want to go. Finally, after all the conversation that, I mean, he's talking to God, right? He's not talking to his wife. He's not talking to his boss, right? And he's not talking to an IRS official. You know, he's talking to Melech Malch Hamlochim, the king of kings of kings. And he's defying God. He's saying, no, I don't want to do it. Yes? And finally, in the end, God says, no. I mean, come on, you know? So God is beginning to uh, express anger. Not that God is angry, but... And finally, Moshe Rabbeinu says, okay, send whoever you want to send. Don't send me. Have I got that? Remember, he's talking to God. And finally, the ultimate defiance is N-O, no, or as they say in Hebrew, loy with an aleph. You see? Not loy with a vav, which means to him. Loy with an aleph, which means no. Uh, believe this? Could you believe this? I mean, it's shocking to look at what he's doing. Why did he do it? Come on. I mean, if God told him, Right? Firstly, God says, He gives him the message. You need to go out and bring my... You need to go and redeem my people. You're the guy. You know? <clears throat> and believe me, Jews need to be redeemed. They are in Egypt suffering. Yes? So clearly there was an unbelievable need for them to be redeemed. Right? And Moshe felt for them. So he should have said, of course I'll do it. Forget about me. For them. Yes? <clears throat> but he said no right and not only that this is God speaking how you defy the greatest being in all existence it's astounding isn't it yes it's very hard to understand and not only that if God said I'm sending you clearly that's a vote of confidence that God believes that you could do it you know what I'm saying <clears throat> the Muslim knows how to evaluate a person you know, he doesn't need a psychological test, right? He doesn't, he doesn't need an interview, right? Uh, what do you call it? A job interview, you know? So the question is why or how <clears throat> is it possible that Moshe Rabbeinu refused to take on the shlichas? Anybody have an idea? It's a very powerful question. Because it's probably, you know, very few times in history did somebody call, talk to God and God said, the guy says, no. I mean, it happened also by Gidon when they wanted him to go to, he lead Kaisra against the war, in the war. So he said, okay, I, I'll give you a test because I have to know if I'm victorious. So there he wanted to know if he was victorious. So he gave a whole test, you know, whatever the test was and so on, right? Okay. He wanted to know if the Banshim is going to really, you know, and so on. But here the Banshim says, take my people out. Hey, I don't care. It's Egypt. Egypt is a zero to me. Uh, question is why? I'll tell you why. Are you here? Because Mo Moshe Rabbeinu feared God. But wait a minute. That doesn't answer this. But let me tell you what the fear is. Okay? Imagine you love a person. Yes? Right? You're all married here? Right? I would assume when you met your wife, you fell in love? Right? I would assume that, right? So after about Two, or two weeks after the engagement, right? I mean, you really love the woman. Or it, it works the same way. A woman loves the guy. It doesn't make a difference. Yes? And all of a sudden, you were going to do something and you realize, hey, it's going to hurt her. She's going to be harmed. Not physically, but emotionally. You're going to hurt this woman. You're going to hurt her feelings. Yes? What would you do? You wouldn't do it. Why? Because at that point in time, right? You're not going to harm her or hurt her feelings in any way because you have tremendous feelings of affection for this 
spouse for this woman. Yes? Is that fear? Of course it's fear. But it's fear that comes out of our love. You see, it's not the fear we think about. It's because you love somebody so much that you're extremely attentive to any type of harm that you could do to that person. You agree with me, guys? Right? <clears throat> I'm not asking you now, you know, after 20 years of marriage, what you do. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> okay. So here's the, the idea. The fear. The fear, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the, the fear disappears over time. <laughs> yes. Anyway, <clears throat> so here's the problem with Shabinu said to himself, you know. Wait a minute. If I take the shlichus, right? I can do it. God, God has full confidence I can do it, right? And obviously the Jews need to be redeemed. But here's the problem. That means I'm going to be in constant contact with God. Obviously, because it's, it's a whole situation here, right? But I'm only human. What happens if I think the wrong thought? Or I say the wrong thing, right? Then, Kaviyochal, I will have offended God. Because the fact that God chose me doesn't mean I can't offend him or I can't make a mistake. Correct? As it is, he made mistakes. He hit the rock. Remember that? Instead of speaking to it. Right? And remember, you remember when God said, take my people out? And all of a sudden, Paroi said, no, we gotta, you guys are lazy. We're going to add to the problems. Now you got to go gather your own straw. So forget about sleep. Right? Uh, and then he came running back to Rabbi Shalom, to God. And he said, what you do this for? You know, you know. not only you didn't take him out, what you send me for? What's the point? You know, <clears throat> so he offended God. He did. Because the Bonisham says, you, you're being mahari after me, doisai. You are questioning my midas, right? And he was punished. Because the Bonisham said, Atta tira, now you will see what I will do to Parai. But you won't see what I will do to the seven nations in Israel because you're not going to Israel. That was a punishment, you see. <clears throat> so, of course, you know, if you're in proximity to somebody, right, you're very, very, and, and, you, and, 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 and you love that person, you're going to make a mistake. Everybody does that. You say the wrong thing to your spouse, or she says the wrong thing to you, it's always going to happen. Why? Because we're human. We don't always think about what we're going to do, how to do it, and so on. Right? So Moshe Rabbeinu said, I, I cannot be in proximity, God, because it's not possible for me not to offend them in some way. You see? So the year of the fear that Moshe Rabbeinu had to such an extent where he would say no to God, right, was because his feeling of love to God was so great that he said, it's not worth for me to do this because in some way I have to offend him. You see? And therefore, no. Send somebody else. No problem. But, so therefore, that's a fear that arises from love. It's an interesting kind of fear. It's a whole different understanding, you see? But that fear is an incredible madrega. You know, you have to be on an awesome level, you know, of dvekus, of love and attachment to God to have that type of fear, you see? But there are, but tzaddikim have that fear, you know? They're very careful, not because they're afraid of punishment. And of course they're in awe of God, there's no question about that, you see? But the real fear is that they love God so much that they're afraid to do anything, you see, because I don't want to offend him. A what? I get it. What are you saying? No, that, no, 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 no. So what do you mean? Uh, what, 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 fear of offending the Israelites? Not if it, no offending God, not the Jews. Well, how would he offend God? If he did something wrong, he said the wrong thing. God said, "I said, say this." You did. You said the wrong thing. You didn't listen to me, exactly, sure. Which is what happened. Remember, I hit the rock, speak to the rock, hit the rock. You know, it's true that God said, okay, you know, you need you and Aaron or whatever going to go into Israel. But consider the, the feelings of God. I, God has no feelings in that sense. But consider the disappointment. Let's look at it that way. Right? And if you love somebody, you don't want to disappoint them either. It's not only harming them, right? That's also an, that's an incredible madrig of fear. You see? And that explains why Moshe Rabbeinu said, no, wasn't worth it. You see? Makes sense.
you know. Uh, at least it's, it's a plausible understanding of how a guy can argue with God in the end and say no. You know. But then the question was, maybe he was right. Maybe he was right. Maybe the, maybe he was right. He said, you know, I mean, so you know, when he said no, it was coming out of an incredible amount of love. So why was God angry with him? Yes, correct. So listen, I know what your fear is, but I'm telling you to go. Don't worry about you offending me. I know you will offend me, you know, and it doesn't mean that I won't punish you, but you're not going to offend me in a sense that you can say no, you know, don't worry about it. So that, but he, you know, the love overran, overruled that thought in, in that sense, you know. Anyway, so therefore, Yira is a critical emotion. Why? <clears throat> because it's called an impediment. It stops you from doing the wrong thing, and also it places you in proper perspective of who you are. <clears throat> Therefore, Ramchal mentions this specifically because Yira is not just a mitzvah. It is a mitzvah which is foundational. It is a mitzvah that describes or determines your acts in terms of you and God. That's foundational. It's not where you shake a lulu of an esrit, you know? Fearing God is foundational. It, you need to have that in terms of, you know, uh, not doing sins, being careful with who you are, speaking with God in a certain respectful manner. It's foundational on all mitzvahs, you see? That's why the Ramchal selects it. It's a foundational or basic mitzvah that embraces your attitude Toward all mitzvahs. Got that? That's why Ramchal chooses it out. Which one? Which type? Yira. Which type of Yira? Is it three types? Any type of Yira. Any type of Yira creates an attitude in you, how you're going to, uh, uh, what do you call it, how you're going to uh, interact with any mitzvah. What do you mean That's when you meet somebody in their place? What does that mean? I mean, you said Yira has two things. First of all, it stops you from doing something wrong, and what's the second thing? No, and that putting you, you know, no, no. It, it puts you in your place. Right. Your insignificance in terms of Third, your I will versus his will. Oh. Yeah. That's it. Your will versus his will. It establishes, right, who you are versus who he is. And as a result of that, you will suspend your desire, your will, and you will do his will. As it says in Perkovus, you you annul your will against his will. You see? And that means you annul your will against his will, means you do the mitzvahs. So it's foundational for all the mitzvahs. This attitude is critical. You see? The question is, how do you develop this? How do you develop awe, really? Anybody know? How do you develop awe? By becoming familiar with the attributes of that which you fear. See? That's how you develop it. What does the Bansham have? We don't see him, right? We don't really, we don't experience him. So how are we going to develop awe? You see? Because what we will do, the Ramam comments on this, you need to understand Bracious, Mice Bracious, the universe. You need to understand reality. You see, and when you look at it, you are awestruck. You cannot believe the incredible intelligence that goes into doing this. God isn't bright and he's not smart. You know, you cannot even begin to describe the intelligence of that being. <clears throat> you know, the human brain, it has 100 billion neurons arranged in ways you can't even comprehend the interconnections because one neuron never touches another neuron it's called a gap a synapse right and what the neuron does when it sends a signal right it sends a chemical messenger over the gap and that's how it communicates that it goes at a couple hundred miles an hour or something like that there are over quadrillion com possible combinations of those gaps. 
uh, you know, the human brain is the greatest, most complex object in the entire known universe. There is nothing as complex as the human brain. And when you think about that, the physical brain, forget about the physical brain, how in the world does the brain create consciousness? Nobody even knows what consciousness is. Awareness, right? You're looking at me. Who are you guys? How in the world are you aware of this shear? Now you're going to say, wait a minute. There are many times the guys are not aware of the shear <laughs> because they're sleeping, right? <clears throat> but at times they are awake, right? Nobody knows what awareness is. Nobody knows what consciousness is. What's memory? Nobody knows. How do I remember something? Because a neuron assumes a certain configuration. What does that have to do with the idea? Nobody knows. Uh, the imagination. You can actually picture something in your mind. How does that work? Nobody understands. How do you reason? How can there be a machine, right, that weighs about what? Three pounds, four pounds? That's all it weighs. You see? That can do, that could create the Empire State Building. You know what I'm saying? That, uh, uh, you look at the developments of man, right? Which is awesome, right? And it was all done with the human mind. How? Because of a four pound piece of gray matter? Give me a break, right? <clears throat> Who did that? That is God. Therefore, the intelligence that went into that is beyond comprehension, you see. It is beyond comprehension. And that's the human mind. What about the heart? It never stops. Do you have a machine that never stops? It's unbelievable. And it's not plugged into the wall? You know, yet the heart beats, what is it, 70, 75 times a minute for 80, 90, 100 years of a guy's life. It never stops. And hopefully never skips a beat. You know what I'm saying? What kind of a pump is this? Beyond belief. Then you have all the, all the, all the organs of the body. You know, where a stomach can break down everything chemically and get, get, take all the nutrients and sh send it to the cells. I mean, the, you, um, <clears throat> the human body is beyond comprehension. So you ask yourself, well, who created this? God. <coughs> what kind of intelligence can make this? And this is just a person, you know. <clears throat> you take a look at it, there's over a hundred million species. An argument of there's 10 million species total. Species, not bug and not objects. <clears throat> you know, I once told you that there are 300,000 different species of beetles. You know, that's beetles. Not 300,000 beetles. There's infinite amount of beetles all over. They're probably crawling around your backyard. Hopefully not in your house, right? But there are 300,000 different types of beetles. And a beetle is an incredibly complex creature. You know, it's beyond belief. And there's a hundred, between 10 and 100 million different species, life forms. What is this? It's only one human, right? What? It's only one species of human. Yes, yeah. I mean, evolutionists would love to argue with you, you know, but there is. And that's one of the biggest refutations of, of evolution. Why is it there are so, like ants, there are 7,000 species of ants. You believe what that is, you know? And probably guys are going to say, I got every one of them crawling in my backyard. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> right? But there's only one species called Homo sapien. Isn't that amazing? So according to Darwin, why aren't there many species? Where are they? It's a tremendous question on Darwin. Why is it every uh, life form has multitude of species, whereas humans have only one? Homo sapiens. You see. Anyway, so therefore that's how you get Europe. The Yira is gotten by understanding the acts of God, which is infinitely greater than the acts of a person. That's it. That's, what, that's how you uh, do all, or get all of God, you know? Um, you know? Um, yeah. That's why it's worthwhile. I want to watch the uh, Course in Biology on a DVD, you know? I, I walk on a treadmill. While I'm on the treadmill, I watch educational videos, you know, uh, and I, there was once a course in biology, you know, and there was this guy, he's a professor, you know, the course was very good, excellent, you know, 
And as he was talking, I, I couldn't believe what this guy was saying. I mean, he was just saying matter of fact. Yeah. But it's incredible. He's describing a cell that the cell closes down, doesn't let anything in. And then if some hormone goes by, it's got an exact key that fits into the membrane. In turns, it's like a key. And all of a sudden, the cell opens up. And there's an incredible cascade of hormones, of enzymes that do it. When he turns it on, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not physical, it's all chemical. Yet there's a whole cascade of chemical events that have to happen when the enzyme hits. It's called the receptor on the, on the, on the cell. The ce cell. Every cell has receptors, which means they have, uh, you know, uh, holes in them, sort of. And there's an exact protein that can fit exactly into that hole in the cell. And <coughs> as soon as it fits, it initiates a cascade of chemical events, right, in the cell, where the cell just opens up and says, okay, come on in. <clears throat> Who in the world, a cell is what, microscopic? Who did this? And so on, you know? And I was, it was just, it, it was a gewaltig lesson, but it, it was, you walk away from that kind of lesson and say, it's awesome who God is. And this is nothing. There was a 72 lectures, and each one was awesome. You realize who the Bansham is. It's just awesome to realize that type of a being. That's how you do it, you see? So that is the whole concept of Yira. Okay, how you get it, what it is, the different types, and why it's fundamental. Because what Yira does, it places you in perspective with God. That's what it does, you know? Ava is different, love is different. I'm sorry, how do you develop your aschet? What was that? How do, you, how do you develop the fear of punishment? You're afraid of getting whacked. It's, 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 the, it's the most uh, primitive of all, in, of all interactions. No, I'm saying it's more specific than just remembering who Hashem is. You also have to know like, what Gehinnom is or like, what punishment is. Well, well, I want to tell you something. You don't have to remember anything. You just have to know you get punished. I mean, I, I, God does not have to describe it to you really he just says if you do this I'm coming after you I'm going to punish you punishment means some type of injury inflicted on your physical body that's what it is you know it doesn't have to say well I'm going to cut your head off or I'm going to pull out your stomach I mean who cares you know what I'm saying so punishment simply means you will be harmed You're that's the most it's basic it's emotion more into detail makes more fear yeah, what I'm sure. saying is that we... Well, well he did go into detail. That's a teichacha. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, he went into detail. But you, I want to tell you something. The teichacha is a tremendous. You know why? Because the teichacha not only goes into details, you know, but it explains things which cannot be. For instance, you know, God says, well, uh, one guy is going to chase seven Jews. Oh, yeah? Who's going to put in the mind of the guy? But God is not talking about it. He's going to do it. He's going to get a guy to do it. How do he do that? Because he can control the guy. You see, it's far more than I will do it. I will get others to do it for me. But the question is, that you control the human mind. You see, how do you do that? Uh, there are many punishments that God says that, has, that doesn't involve him directly. Because he doesn't. It involves people, societies. And not only that, he says, your, your crops won't grow. Yeah? Since when do you control the crops? You know, I plant, it comes out, you know. That means God controls people. He controls vegetation, crops, planting, disease, you name it, he's the boss. You see, <clears throat> that's the tremendous difference you should know between God, the Rabbani Shalom, in the Torah, and religions, you know. All other religions say, if you don't listen to what I say, you will not get the future world. You're doomed, condemned forever to perdition. Ganem hell why because prove it <laughs> prove it they can't prove it because there's zeros so they have if they want to warn you to somehow you know join their belief system or religion they gotta pr say i can do something which you anyway never know uh, but only the Russian could say right that if you don't worship me serve me you will starve nothing will grow you know, the Bansham will do things that are here and now, that you could visibly see. You see, what a difference. But that means he's in control of everything. Oh, you see? I mean, Shvius is a classic example, right? Don't grow Shvius, right? You know, don't, you can't grow anything in the seventh year, correct? And if you don't do that, right, you'll have enough in the sixth year 
for the produce of the seventh, eighth, and ninth year. Oh yeah? You control the, uh, the agriculture? Nobody can make a promise like that because we could see if he could deliver or not. So we know the truth of what he says. We could see if it's a lie or true because we can see the punishment. The Torah is filled with punishments that you could see and are not directly connected to God, which clearly means he has control of everything. Am I answering your question? I, I, I would think you would go more into Rosh's cho- learning Rosh's Chochmah or something like that. Well, Rashi's Chochmah, you know, is, is uh, in many ways, it, you know, people say you should not learn Rashi's Chochmah because it's frightening. You know, I want to tell you something. In the old days when people were more in control of themselves, you know, then maybe you needed more of that, you know. Today, everybody else is just shattered being. We're walking around, we're all crushed. Let's face it. You don't realize that. And so therefore, you know, well, come on, you don't want to get a guy to worship God because you're going to smack him around. As it is, we're all crushed. We're all deflated because we have sorrows, right? There's suffering and there's sorrows with all kinds of problems, you know? So what are you going to say? We don't do a mitzvah, I'm going to chop your head off. You know, what's that going to do for us, really, you know? Yeah, and so on, you know? But so therefore, even though that's safer, for its time was okay. But today, you know, you, 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 that, that safe has fell out of disuse. That's exactly what ISIS is doing. That what? Exactly what ISIS is doing. Yeah, oh yeah. <coughs> yeah. But, the <coughs> but I don't understand what your question is. What's the, your question? The Hester in today's world does not allow us to see the, the, the connection between, between the, the, the Teichacha and our actions. Yeah. We don't see this nowadays. Do we? No. No. <coughs> so is there another way to develop your head? Or just not necessary <coughs> to, develop, to, to, to work on that part? Well, today, your head is much more difficult. Why? Because you don't see the hand of God. So it is more difficult, yes. You know. Um, for somebody who believes that God exists, there is a fear of God. Yeah, the truth is, anybody who believes He exists, which is really a lot of people, you know, they are afraid because they know this. The key concept is accountability. Anybody who believes that God exists knows that you are accountable. That automatically will stop you from doing many things. If you don't believe in God, like atheists, then you're right. Where are you going to get the years cut? You don't believe God exists. You know what I'm saying? But most people in this planet do believe in some form of a supreme being, hopefully it's God, right? And that there is an accountability. So, so therefore, want to believe in what was that? That's why people don't want to believe in God. Oh yeah, well, of course. Well, no, people don't want to believe in God not because of punishment. They don't want to believe in God because they want to do whatever they want to do, which is a flip side of saying you're going to be punished. Yeah. Accountability is critical. We have, we have personal reminders all the time. Yeah. In what way? Earthquakes, tsunamis, 9-11. Yeah, but a guy can say this is natural events. No, but personally, I mean, everybody experiences... Sorry. Accountability means that you are accountable. You know, an earthquake would say, well, it was tectonic plates rubbing against each other. You know, tough luck. You know, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's why you just say, you know, all of a sudden your house collapsed on yourself. Right? Uh, fine. Mm-hmm. But so what? I can still do whatever I want. Because you don't, you don't see that that event is connected to my actions. Hey, you know, I, I sinned, I did whatever I want, you know. The earthquake, it's a natural event. But in Yerushachet means that you see where the punishment is connected to your actions. How could we do that without a Navi? What? How could we do that without a Navi? Because... We believe that. No, no, we no. We believe, but you can never... I, I think nowadays you're not allowed to pinpoint this is because of that. No, I, no that's not true. You can't. Because when God punishes, it's always with meter connected meter, measure for measure. So if something happens to you, you could say, wait a minute, something has happened to me, and I know why, because I see the exact reverse of what I did. You remember what I said about Trump, North Korea? You could see the meter connected meter. You know, you want to allow an existential threat to exist for Israel, all right, Iran? I'll show you what, I'll, I will punish you with the exact same thing that you're doing. And I will allow North Korea to come up and put them in the mind of that crazy lunatic, right? King Kim Jong Un, whatever his name is, right? And he's going to threaten the U.S., which is insane. I mean, it's really insane. I mean, the U.S. can wipe him out in 30 seconds, you know? Okay, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's an insane individual that can threaten uh, a Goliath. That's really what it is, you know? But he does that. But God put it in his mind to make sure, you know, as a punishment, that Trump now has to deal with this maniac. You see what I'm saying? It's a, it's a, it's a, to warn him. 
You need to stop Iran. Cut it out. Stop playing around. You see? I don't know if he got it. I mean, eventually he will do it, but I mean, I, we don't really know what he'll do with Iran. You know? There's other punishments that the Bershom is doing. You know? But you, so you can see what if it's a punishment, if you're attuned to, you know, what's happening, you see, you know? And so on, you know? But anyway, this is the concept of Yiro. It's a, a, which is a foundational mitzvah in terms of observing all Torah, you know. Next week we'll talk about Ava, which is love, which is a different foundational concept, you see. But we already see the connection between love and Yira, that you can fear doing something against God because you love God so much. So why isn't Ava first? Why isn't Ava first? Why do you say Yira first? Because Yira is usually precedes Ava. It usually precedes Ava, right? It's much faith? easier to be afraid than to love. No, no, no. To love, so you should know, to fear somebody is simple. All you have to do is feel threatened. But to love somebody means you gotta, how do you get to love anybody, really? You know what I'm saying? Love everybody, you gotta work on it. It's not the, you know, and so on, you know. Um, so that's, that's the next, that's foundational. What was that? Yeah, but the question is, what is the essential nature of that relationship that will force the love? Yeah, that's the question, you know. And, and so on. So we'll talk about that next week. Well, the mitzvah after we say in Shema, after we say in well, that, that, well, that's the origin of the fact that you have to love. But the question is, okay, what about, what is it, and how do you create it, and so on, you know? What prevents it? You know, we'll talk about that next week. Okay. Well, Any other questions? So we'll work on our year this week, right? We'll work on our fear, so on our year or what? For Yira, to develop Yira is to look at our stuff, look at our own lives, and to, to study to study what's, what's, what's happening to us. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. And study who Hashem, the, the awesome Hashem Hashem. Well, that, in order to, get, in order to gain the, the fear of the awe, you need to study God. It has to be healthy fear, though. What was that? A person can't get all bent out of shape because of it. Bent out of shape? Meaning he can't, sometimes fear can be taken to an extreme. Well, that's and true of anything, yeah, of course, yeah. And then the person, that, that it stops being uh, useful. Or well, it can become dysfunctional, yeah, that's true. Right. But uh, anyway, the, but the uh, Yira, Yira Soroimimus requires uh, um, um, investigation. You need to study God to get Yira Soroimimus. That's the only way. Love is different. You know, love requires something else, but Yira requires, real Yira, or, or let's put it this way, a higher form of Yira requires understanding God and creation. You need, an Amoritz cannot be a Yira Shemayim, because you don't know anything, you know. <clears throat> but when you study... Require, how, come, how come not love? What was that? How come love doesn't require investigation? It's different. I'll talk about that next week. Love does not require investigation. You don't have to investigate a spouse. You don't fall in love with a spouse because, although when you go for a shidduch, you got a whole list there, right? But you don't fall in love. And you should investigate. Yes, no, no, what you do, no, what you do is, you know, there's a checklist, right? The checklist is meaning to tell you who should I go out with. Would I fall in love with the girl is a different story, right? So that you have to understand, you know? So that's just the, what's called a screening. It's called a screen test. The Abbas Hashem doesn't require investigation. It, it, it does, but it's not, in, in, in not it, it, it does in a certain way, but it's not the, um, well, you know, it, I'll, let me side with what you said. It, it does require investigation. Uh, it, what are you saying is true. I will step back and, it was, you know, I'm just looking at it from a different perspective, but I can see from your perspective, it does require investigation. But it requires something more fundamental, which you have to know. You know, like say, let's say, you know, to know God is awesome requires to, to, to you to look at his, his behavior, his acts, what he did. And the whole universe testifies to a God by the complexity. It testifies to God. The whole universe, mice, uh, you know, and so on, you know. Uh, so in that sense, you have to investigate the universe. Yeah. If you study science, I'll tell you something. <coughs> If you sit down and take a, like, you know, and uh, you study science for the pr specific purpose of knowing God so you can fear Him, you should know that is Torah. 
Are you studying physics? It doesn't make a difference. <coughs> because in order to get Yira, you need to do this. So therefore, this is a mitzvah. To study God is a mitzvah. You, you know, because if you, do, I'm not talking, you know, if you're doing that for a job, but if you're watching something because you want to know about the, the world, the universe, and so on, in order to fear God, to know His acts, that is Torah. Yeah, even though it's science, it doesn't make a difference. You see? Which is also very interesting to, to know. So if you want to get, if you go to school, right? Let's say you're going, you're taking a, some type of course or whatever, and you want to make that Torah, just have in Kavona, in your intent, that I want to know something about God or whatever, and this course is going to help me attain that knowledge in order to allow me to do a certain mitzvah, Bemo, that is Torah. You don't have to say the Torah for it. No, <laughs> no. No, you don't have to say the the Torah, although that's an interesting thought. <laughs> Imagine walking into a classroom and saying, Boruch Atoash, no. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but, it, but it is Torah. In fact, if you get on and go to a gym, and the reason why you're going to a gym is because of Nishmata Mi'oidis Nafshusechem, where God says, you will watch exceedingly your soul, which means physical health, you are Mekayim Mitzvah by going to a gym. Mamash. It's not I who say that, uh, I think it's Chazoy I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious. You know, Mitzvah is not only a specific act, but, if, but Torah can be, have many manifestations besides learning the Torah itself, but to learn that which will allow you to do a mitzvah is Torah. You see? It's far more extensive than we imagine. What's the middle level of Yira called? The one where it's the myself or there's nothing that you are shown? Or, Romus. Romus. Yira is a chet, which is punishment. Yira is haromimus, right? His, his exaltedness. Fear of his exaltedness, and then the year of me'avo. That's Moshe Rabbeinu. You see? Okay, I think we covered it pretty good. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot more. There's a, you know, there's a lot of how, how to get it, and how to avoid it. So you have from Chavos Avos. I mean, you know, or Chesadikim will talk. You know, but for an essential understanding, and that's what I always try to do. What the essential understanding is, uh, I think we did okay. Okay, next next week we talk about love.